Tonight we are at step two in which we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. <clears throat> you know, step two is a, where we start moving away from step one. As we begin, we do a review and look at step one and I think once we see that, then we can, the first two steps are quite simple. We say the first step really shows the alcoholic where he is, exactly where he is. And based on that information, then the second step says, real simple, it says we believe it'd be better over here. And so we have to establish these two points before we can get into the journey. And then the real test is to, a job to go from here to here. But beginning with, well, first we got to see exactly where we are, and this is the first step. It says we're powerless over alcohol in our lives and become, become unmanageable. This just shows us what is the problem. And the exact nature of where we are in our lives. And this is, this is the beginning point because, you know, you got to, before you make the journey, you got to see exactly where you are. And we found out the problem last week as we went through the problem. The problem was twofold. Part of it is in the body, part of it is physical, and the main part is in the mind. And we have a physical allergy to alcohol, an abnormal reaction. That is, when we take, when the alcoholic takes something to his body, something occurs, that it, something takes place that doesn't take place in the average temperate drinker, as Dr. Silkworth said. And he said, once the alcoholic takes a drink, he experiences a physical craving of alcohol. And once he experiences this physical craving, the craving produces one drink and another drink and another drink and another drink. And he goes through the well-known spree, and he emerges with remorse with a firm resolution not to do it again. And he repeats this over and over and over again. Now the problem is, this is a, this is a real big problem, but it's not the main problem of the alcoholic. Our book says the main problem of the alcoholic sin is in his mind, and this would be academic anyway. The fact that you're allergic to alcohol if you never took the first drink anyway, because you'd never experienced this. So, but the main problem of the alcoholic is, is something in his mind, we're going to be talking about that tonight, that tells him he can drink. He has this obsession. Or as our book says, in some other words, he has this illusion or this delusion that he can drink. And the mainly that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, to, to, be what, to get rid of that, to, to believe that a power greater than ourselves can remove that obsession or that illusion or that delusion to drink. Because once the alcoholic, once the mind gives him permission to drink, he puts the alcohol in his system, he triggers the allergy, and the allergy produces a craving, the craving produces a second drink, and he continues to drink, and he gets in trouble. And he repeats this over and over again, as we said, the mind triggering the body, and the body in reverse triggering the mind. Because the more we take the first drink, the mind tells us to take a drink, and it gives us permission to drink. And we put the alcohol into our system, then the, the craving gets harder as the years go by. The drinking gets harder. As the drinking gets harder, the emotional problems increase to trigger it back again. So if we have this problem, uh, and we at least understand it, and I thank God for, the, for Dr. Silkworth. And we, can, we as individuals, once we see the problem, it don't make any difference how devastating it might be once you see the problem, you can always begin to figure, at that point, you can begin to find a solution or figure out some way to, to overcome it. And, and it says, because of this, we are powerless. We are powerless. And if we are powerless, then the second step is going to begin. Once we see this, the second step is going to say, obviously, come to believe that a power 
greater than ourselves. And in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, I love the way he starts out. Once we have the see the doctor's opinion and Bill's story, this section of a book talks about the problem. And once we see the problem, then the second chapter of our book talks about there is a solution. There's a solution to this problem. It says many of us are just as hopeless as Bill, but we have recovered. We have found the solution. And it talks about the power right on that page. I love that page, but because right on that page it describes the, the, the power. It gives us, it writes a prescription on page 17 of the big book of that power. And it talks, again, it talks about the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is a, a verb, it's a, it's a therapeutic group. Uh, it's a support group. It's a group of people who have the same problem. And, and as these people come together, this gives hope to the new alcoholic. It, uh, this is the first beginning of that power. You know, it's, 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 it's really, it's totally impossible to, to go to an AA meeting like here tonight. If you're an alcoholic looking for, for some help or looking for a way out, uh, if you do no more than this, be here amongst the people who have recovered from the same problem you got, you're going to feel better when you leave, whether you get any information or not. You're going to have some support. You're not going to be alone. Our book says that we are average Americans. And we come from all sections of this country. We have many different occupations. There are many different occupations in AA. If we went around in room tonight, we could find all kinds of occupations in this room, you know. People that do everything to make a living. There are many different religions, different social backgrounds, different e economic backgrounds. We here in this room tonight are normally people that should not mix, our book says. You know, alcoholics, AA is made up of the most mixed up group of people in the world. You know, there are all kinds of people in here. You know what I mean? We come from different races, different backgrounds. We should not have even known each other. We have really have, we really have nothing in common but one thing. We're normally people that should not mix. But amongst us, there is a fellowship and a friendliness and understanding that is indescribably wonderful. We're very close. And our book explains this, the fellowship, that he says, we are like the passengers on a great liner. And, I, and when this book was written, this was very timely because this is the way we travel to Europe. This is a parable that teaches, teaches us what we're all about. And we are on, we were, and, and, and this, on these great ocean liners, they travel across the ocean. And as we were traveling across the, the ocean of life, you know, we were all doing our thing. <laughs> Everybody was doing his thing. The doctor was doctoring, the lawyer was lawyering, the painter was painter. They were, we were all going through life doing our thing. We should have never met. Just like the peace, you know, people on the great ocean liner. <coughs> it says from the steerage to the captain's table. Well, that guy was down there in the steerage section. In the steerage section of the vessel, that's the uh, cheapest way to travel. That's where the immigrants and the people didn't have much money. The people in the steerage section had the wrong economic background. And some of them had the wrong religion. And those people, the only thing they had down there was, you know, they probably had a cots and, and bunk beds to sleep in, and they had meals brought to them, but accommodations weren't too good. Now, as you came on up from on the vessel, when you got on to the uppermost decks, where they had the fine state rooms and the beautiful dining rooms, the people in there, they had the right, they had the right money. They had the right religion. They had the right social background. And if they were, uh, they could sit at the captain's table. And the captain had a huge table and the, and the best people sat at the captain's table. Now there was a long way between the captain's table and the steward section. And that's the way we were as we journeyed through life. We should have never met, but in a moment of disaster, and I always think about the Titanic that night, when he hit that iceberg and when that guy from the captain's table and that poor guy from the steerage section, when he got out from down there, it took him a long time. <laughs> when they jumped overboard, when they hit that ice water, they had something in common. They had a common problem. <laughs> you know, and they came together as friends, you know, to save their lives. You know what I mean? And this is what Alcoholics Anonymous, this is what the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is. You know? 
It don't care what your background is. We don't need to know your occupation. You know? But you, uh, if you're an alcoholic and you have suffered alcoholism, you have a ticket. You don't have an admission to the fellowship. You're a part of the group. You don't have to do nothing else. You don't, you know, you paid a good price. To, you paid a good price, you know. But you, you're a part of Alcoholics Anonymous. And this is a, it is a very powerful thing to be amongst people who have recovered from the same thing that's tearing your life up. But my book says that this, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is part of this power. But that is not, this is, is more to it than that. It's more than just going to the meetings. It's more than the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. My book said this would have not held us as we're now held. So the fellowship is great, you know. We come to the meeting, we drink a lot of coffee, go to the bathroom a lot, and tell a lot of lies, you know, but that's fine, you know. <laughs> but there's more to it than that. He said, the one thing that we can join in brothers' harmony and action, not only do we have the same common problem, that's fine. That puts us in the fellowship. But what really binds us together? we have the same common solution. So the, there's power in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. But that is not enough. Then later on in our book, he's going to say that the other part, the real recovery from alcoholism is a vital spiritual experience. And we believe, you know, look, we can look at these two things. We can look at the power of Alcoholics Anonymous and the power of the spiritual experience, we believe that that power, what we're saying in the second step, we believe that that power can overcome the powerlessness of one person's alcoholism. The power of the fellowship and the power of the spiritual experience. Came to believe that this power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. You know, and it begins, uh, uh, you know, we say the Going to AA meetings is fine. They used to, you know, for a new person, we don't not go into meetings. Going to meetings is fine. That's what you got to do. But you got to do more than that. Just like I, I tell people, you know, it's very simple. I think it's quite obvious. You couldn't go to the PTA meeting for 90 days and become a parent. You'd have to do something else. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, that would, you'd have to go through another set of steps in order to become a parent. And if you want to recover, there is a process. We guarantee for our recovery, and this is the last 10 steps. Why worry about it? We have some steps that are guaranteed to produce the second half of this solution if you take it. So on the second step says all we have to do is come to believe. And I think, you know, um, you know our book says that some of us are, are atheists, are agnostics, and, it's, it's, and said to, to people like that, this seems impossible. And it was for me when I know when I come to the program, you know, I didn't, didn't, uh, I had, a, had all these things mixed up. I heard uh, many years of my life, people told me, says, son, all you got to do is have faith in God and you'll be all right. And I never did have faith in God. And it's hard to have faith in God when you just barely do believe. And Alcoholics Anonymous allowed me to start right there. It says you don't have to have faith. All you have to do is to believe. And they said, if you can't believe, then you just become willing to believe. And that's real simple. You know, believing is the beginning of anything that we do. Uh, and as we look at these things, the first thing we do in anything, it's a sum total of our lives. The ability to believe, and each and every one of us has we have that individual ability. It's, it's our power to believe in whatever we choose. It's our right. And it is, it is, no one can, people can sway this thing. But whatever we believe, we can achieve. Whatever we believe, we're going to become. Believing is what we, is our understanding of something before we do it. Before. Now you can't have faith before. The only thing you can do before you do something is to believe. And this is where we begin. And, and I don't see why we have trouble with believing. And, and uh, how can we not believe when we come to AA and see so many other people 
who said that I, I, I did these steps and I found a pile greater than myself and I don't have to drink anymore. As Bill said in his story, you know, he said, you know, Ebby sat across the table for him, from him. <laughs> and he said he was looking right at him. He said this man had been hopeless. You know, and he said that this happened to him. And thank God, you know, if it hadn't been for some other person that came to us, we couldn't believe on our own. It's looking at the other people, believing in what they say. And once we see where we are, it says we believe that we can make it over there. Now, believing is the beginning, and what we do in this program, and this is, this is uh, not new. Believing is, that's the biggie. Now, once we believe, then we can make decisions. Now, a decision is a domino theory. Believing won't do any good at all. Because you really don't get anything out of that. It's like going over the racetrack. And you say, I believe this horse is going to win. I, I did that one day. I was over there. But I didn't bet on it. I didn't, put, I didn't make no decision. If you believe he's going to win, you have to make a decision. And even after I made a decision, I still didn't take any action. See, the decision has to produce action. And once you take the action, they'll pay you for result, results for what you put up. So, believing leads to decision, decision leads to action, actions leads to results. And once we get results, then we know. And that's faith. You know, you really can't start off with faith. Now the next time, you know, use this, I like to use it like guy, my car is broken, I go over and say, hey Lewis, I'm having trouble with my car. And Lewis said, oh, what's your, you know, old man, my man over here is a good mechanic, and I said, oh, I don't know anything about that, I ain't got no faith in the man, he's a mechanic, but I can believe Lewis. And if I believe him strong enough, I will make a decision and carry my car over there. And if the man does a good job on my car, I will end up, I will have faith in him. And the next time my car needs some, I need some repair work, I'll go back on faith. But I have to start off with believing. And this is all we require to do. Believing is the beginning of anything. You know, believing is the beginning, success or failure begins with believing. And if believing is a power that we all have, but sometimes we'd be better, We'd be better off if we didn't have it. But you can't turn believing off. It's like a searchlight that stays on. And if you believe the, if you believe the wrong, you're going to get in trouble. If you believe right, you're going to be successful. If you believe failure, you're going to fail. And it's our ability. You know, it's a whole lot of people in trouble tonight because they believed wrong. It's a whole lot of people in prison because they believed they could steal. Right? They really... When they start stealing, they believe that they could steal and get away with it. And they made a decision, took the action, and got caught. <laughs> See me? They believed a lie. Why they was believing they could steal and get away with it, the police was believing they could catch them. If you believe a lie, they say, uh, uh, hell is a truth seen too late because we believe a lie. And they say, if you believe a lie, they say the truth will set you free. And the first step is the truth. It should it begins right there, setting you free from the lie. Because it shows you that you can't drink. And you can't use alcohol. And once you see that truth, see the lie, then we're going to be talking about looking at where we should be. Now, there's a lot of illustrations in the book, and I love the big book, how it, how it deals with this. It, he takes a lot of time and I, to show us uh, uh, how to use this. He talks about on page 51 in this book, you know, how this world of ours, in this world of ours, you know, how much progress we have made in, in down through years. We have made more progress in the last, he says, in the last millenniums than all the men that lived before. And this is true. Uh, in the last 100 years, most of the modern inventions and transportations and forms of energies 
uh, all the great advancements that's taken place in the last 100 years. You know, all of our means of transportation and energies and all these things. And all the other time, men on the face of this earth, they discover none of these things. And, it, you know, we would probably assume that we are smarter than those people that lived hundreds of years ago, but this is not true. They were just as, we find out that they are there, their minds were just as great as ours. But they discovered nothing. They invented nothing. It says their minds were fettered by superstitions and all sorts of fixed ideas. You know, they had certain rules in, those, in the old days, society. You know, what you couldn't believe in that old society. You had to believe what everybody else believed. You couldn't do nothing new. I mean, three or four hundred years ago, if somebody saw you going down through town with a, some wires and, and tubes and things, and you said, what are you doing? I'm making a television. They said, what's that? Well, it's going to show a picture. Boy, they'd cut your head off. <laughs> you know. It wasn't too many years ago that we were, burn, we were burning people at the stake because they chose to believe different. You had to believe like everybody else. You couldn't believe different. And about the only way you can change in life is you have, you have to believe different. And surely if you're here, here tonight, if you, you can't keep believing the way you are and make any changes. Because whatever we believe, we become. And if we're going to change, we have to believe different. Now our book says some of the contemporaries of Columbus, and I love, that's one of my favorite guys. Boy, I was uh, thinking about him last month, Columbus Day. I think we ought to celebrate his day because that's, he's a typical alcoholic. You know, Columbus, uh, the people in Columbus Day, they said uh, the world was square. Right? Now we know he was an alcoholic because nobody but an alcoholic could believe against everybody in the world. You got to be hard-headed to do that. <laughs> Against everybody, everybody else says it's square, and this one little drunk said it's round. <laughs> now, and they kept saying he's crazy, yeah. crazy. Here comes that round world guy. <laughs> but he believed it, and he stuck with it, you know. And, and the whole thing, the whole story, as we go through it, you know, you can see he's a drunk. Who else but a drunk would say something like that? They asked him, where are you going to Columbus? He said, I'm going east by sailing west. Now, that's a drunk statement, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no way you can go east by sailing west. But, but and when he, kept, when he left, he didn't know where he was going. That's a drunk. When he got there, he didn't know where he was. <laughs> And when he got back, he didn't know where he'd be. <laughs> well, what really made him an alcoholic, a woman financed the whole trip, you know. <laughs> now, we know Columbus believed the world was round, but we, I, I, I really suspect that the first two or three nights out, he hired a special sailor. He believed it was round. But he hired him one special sailor and put him on the front of the vessel. And he said, hey, if you see the edge of this damn thing, you holler out. <laughs> <coughs> but he did somehow believe. He believed. And he didn't, like I say, he didn't know where he was going. He's, he landed down here in the San Salvador, down here in the Bahamas. And when he got there, he thought he was in the East Indies, thousands of miles away, <laughs> on the other side. <laughs> but he, he dared to believe. He had to believe different from everybody else in order to change. And we can see what this one little thing did. And I love it. It's, it's one of the most powerful illustrations of the power of believing and the changes it can make in human life. See, he changed the maps of the world. He changed the economics of the world. Come here. He changed the lives of everybody on the face of this earth. And everybody that lives probably since him because he dared to believe different. And that's the only way we can change. We've got to believe different. 
Because if we believe the same, we will be the same. You know, it goes on and uses, uh, our book does teach with parables, and I, I love the parables of the big book. It paints pictures in our minds. And he says, what about the, uh, the Wright brothers? Look at, look at the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers, the, this, their childish faith, which was belief. At that time, you know, um, some great people had attempted to build an aircraft that would fly, um, and they failed. Uh, they had a lot of aeronautical engineers, a lot of smart people fail. And since these smart people fail, the people who knew, they wrote a book and said it couldn't be done. <laughs> yeah. See, that was the engineers of those times, the aeronautical engineers. They said man could never fly. It was something that reserved from the birds. God reserved this right for the birds. And here comes the right brothers along. And the Wright brothers believed that they could, as bad as Columbus. Now the Wright brothers were not aeronautical engineers. They didn't have, they hadn't read those books. The Wright brothers were high school dropouts. And they were bicycle mechanics. It's pretty hard for a bicycle mechanic to believe he can build an airplane. You know I mean? no, more, no different from a drunk to believe he can stay sober. But all you got to do is believe it. And I'm sure, you know, it was on this simple belief that they began. And, and uh, they finally got the thing to fly. And after they got it to fly, they wouldn't even, the newspaper wouldn't even print it because they believed a lie so strong you know I mean? that they wouldn't say, hey, I'm not going to put that in the paper. So all we have to do at this point, before this thing happens, is to believe. See, this is what Abby brought to Bill. And it comes from the, from, the, from the psychiatrist. The second step, it came from Dr. Carl Jung. The first step came from Dr. Silkworth. And, and, and it was a guy named Roland H. from New York, a guy from a, from a wealthy family. And his, his family had spent a lot of money on him. And Dr. Silkworth gave this to Bill, showed, told Bill about the problem at the, at the hospital. Bill understood that. But over here was a psychiatrist in Zurich, Switzerland. And Roland had went to this guy, Roland Hazard. He went to this guy and, and he treated him and he got drunk and he went back again. And finally the doctor said, Roland, uh, he said, doctor, is there any, any hope? He said, yes. Here and there, every once in a while, alcoholics are what I'll call, have what I'll call vital spiritual experiences. And this is what we're talking about in our 12th step. This is what will come as results of our steps. And he said, Roland, I've been trying to produce these things in you, but I've never been a successful alcoholic of your type. And of course, quite naturally at that time, you know, the Oxford groups was a great, it was a great movement across the country. People were involved in this, and this is where a lot of this was taking place. So Roland came back, and he got in the Oxford groups, and by practicing their principles, which basically became our, our recovery steps, he had this thing happen in his life. Now, he heard about a, a guy in jail, another drunk named Ebby. He got Ebby out of jail and kind of straightened him up for a while, for a couple of months. And Ebby brought this solution to Bill. He told him, he said, by practicing these little principles in the Oxford groups, I have recovered. And so this came to believe that a power, this was where it came from. It came from Dr. Carl Jung. It came back from Roland to Ebby and from Ebby to Bill. And Ebby told him, he said, I have been practicing these things and, and I haven't had a drink. So as he, when, when Ebby walked into his kitchen, these two things met. And Bill not only had the problem, he had an answer. And later on, he was able to write this down, this answer down for us. And this is what, if you're here tonight and you have a problem, there is a solution to it. The power that lies within the fellowship, the support group, and the power of the spiritual experience that will come as results of the last 10 steps in our program will produce a personality change sufficient to recover. And all we have to do is believe. The second part of our step says, you know, believe what? You know, this step is complete. It didn't say we had to believe everything. My God, you know, uh, uh, you know God is awesome. We have to believe in one specific area. 
came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could, didn't say he would, restore us to sanity. Now, boy, I got mad when I heard that. Wait a minute, I ain't crazy. I was in the nut house, but I wasn't crazy. <laughs> you know, I really, I was telling the guys today about that. I really shudder when I hate to talk about that. Here I am sitting in the nut house. Now, I was the smartest guy in the nut house. You know, I had a, and in this particular nut house, we had a lot of mental patients in there, a few, few alcoholics. Most of them were, had something else wrong with them. And this guy had been there for 10 or 12 years. He was uh, one of the mainstays of the war. And I was getting ready to go home, and he said, I want to talk to you. And I said, what do you want? What do you want? You know, they was worse. I did, you can't, it's like a bunch of flies. Get, get away. Get away. What do you want? And he kept on insisting on talking to you. And he, this went on for all that morning. And I finally, I said, well, what do you want, man? He said, come here. He did me like this. So I went over and sat down on a little bench we had over there. And I said, what, what's the matter, man? What do you want? He said, you're getting ready to go home, aren't you? You know, it got around the war that I was going home. I said, yeah. Now, this guy had been there 10 or 12 years and seeing alcoholics come and go. You know, we all stay 30 days and get out and come back. This guy, he never had an opportunity to get out of there. And he looked at me and he said, Joe, when you go home, if you don't drink no more, you won't have to come back here. Now, this man was crazy. <laughs> he was a crazy man. <laughs> see, he could see the truth, and I could. Now, you know, when they didn't say that I was crazy, you know, we talk about the word sanity comes from the word sanitas, which means whole or complete of mind. You know, and that's pretty hard to be. When we really think about it, I don't know if anybody is whole or complete at all times. No one is that way. You know. Now, I, I, I used I, I I had a problem with the word insanity. I didn't quite understand it. And you know, crazy means if we think about somebody crazy, you you know, you might think a guy that's crazy probably has got quite a bit gone. He might be about like that. You know, he, he ain't got, he's got a lot missing. You know what I mean? He's less than whole. You ain't really ready to get locked up till you get below half. And then they're going to lock you up, you know. <laughs> but crazy, uh, insanity. So we might say that this guy is insane to a, a degree. Because a lot of his is missing. Now the alcoholic is not the crazy. It said that in one area, the book says in all other areas, you know, he's got great judgment. Got a great mind. I've never seen a dumb alcoholic. I see him do some dumb things. But I usually see sharp, intelligent people. But... When it comes to alcohol, this one little sliver here, something is missing. When we look at our logic or our judgment toward the first drink. Now our book says the, the, the thing that it seems to, we have some failures. We have a bad memory too about alcohol. It says, you know, our book talks about it, this little point, you know, he said, the same defense that keep, keeps us from putting our hand on a hot stove. Now, you know, I, I have been burned by a stove or something. I've been burned by something like that several times. And I remember it. I remember the time I was a kid. And, and uh, my dad came home from a place where he worked. And they had those, he worked at an automobile place. And they had those great, big, huge Lincolns, you know. And back in those, none of the younger people won't remember that. Most of you won't hear. But we used to pull those uh, 
I would pull that uh, cigarette lighter out. They used to have a wire on the end of the cigarette lighter that went into it. And it was red, and I put my finger on it. I never shall forget. It burned the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> that happened one time. And I remember it to the day. Now that's a, you know, that's, that's normal. You're supposed to remember that. But alcohol burned me thousands of times. Thousands of times. And I never could remember it. I would say, this time, it won't burn me. <laughs> and it said, restore me to sanity. And sanity is to believe a lie. When I, when I, I picked up a drink, I believed that I can drink. And my book talks about this strange mental blank spot. Oh, we're fine. Yeah, we can run the show from here to here. But when it comes to that strange mental blank spot, we, I as an individual, if you are an alcoholic, you are defenseless against that first drink when that occurs. You are defenseless. And what we've been come to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sin. You know, and that, my book talks about after you work the steps, after the t ten step, after the tenth step, it says sanity will have returned. It says we can make sound decisions about drinking. You know, as a result of these steps, we are made whole. Well, here at the second step, all we have to do is to believe this. Now, I didn't say that, that, it didn't say the alcoholic is crazy. He ain't all gone. He just ain't all there. You know what I mean? That little piece, when it comes to alcohol, it's got something missing. You know, it would be insane for me tonight to go take a drink. And the only way I could go take a drink tonight is I would have to believe that I can drink. When every alcoholic walks into a bar or liquor store, he believes that he can drink. You know, he goes in there and he said, Mr., <laughs> That's gonna be. I'm gonna have a good time this time. You know what I mean? It ain't gonna hurt me. I'm not gonna get in trouble. I'm not gonna get a DWI. You know what I, mean? I'm, I believe I'm gonna just have a drink, have a good time, and go home. And he takes that drink, but it, and then the, the same thing occurs, and he gets in trouble. Now the truth is, he can't drink. He can't walk in the bar on the truth. He can't walk in the bar and say, "Hey, Mister." Like I would have to do. Say, lady, mister, I had some of this to drink 24 years ago. I ended up in the nut house like damn near killed me. I lost my job. I almost lost my family. I almost lost, I almost lost my life. How much would you charge me? How much is it? another bottle of that stuff cost? I want to buy some more of that fun. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to be in a strange mental blank spot to do that. <laughs> so all we have to do here at this point to begin is to believe that this can happen to you. That's all you got to do. You don't have to know it. You don't have to have faith in it. All you have to do is to believe that you can do it. And this is the second step. So the first step tells us where we are. And once we see where we are, the second step gives us an alternative. You know, you can't take an alternative until you see where you see the first step. You don't need an alternative. But once you see the vulnerable position is you're powerless, then you can say, I believe I, I should be over here. And these, two, these steps are not any time. This is, like we said, the 12-step plan of recovery is as simple as anybody. You know, back in, I love, every time I think about this, this step, I think about the prodigal son. He used this same program. He was in trouble. Uh, he sounded a little bit alcoholic, too. You know, there were three things in that story that were lost. There was a sheep that was lost, and, and when, the sheep, the, when the sheep are lost, it's not the sheep's fault. The sheep's a dumb animal, and the reason the sheep is lost is that the shepherd lost the sheep. See, the shepherd lost the sheep because he's the one that Watches them, controls them. So he allowed the sheep to get away. And the sheep was lost. 
And the shepherd went out and found it. That was his responsibility. And this woman lost a coin. In those days, they would sew coins into their hats. And, and this woman lost one of her, her coins, and everybody, it's like the women that wear them on their wrists. And she treasured this. So she went around the house, and it wasn't the coin's fault. She lost it. So it was her responsibility. She swept diligently until she found it. And then there was a prodigal son that was lost. See, but the prodigal son, didn't nobody lose him. <laughs> he left on his own. He said, give me, you know, he was waiting for to get his inheritance. He said, I want mine now. So he left on his own and got out and had a good time. Said wine, women, and song. So that sounds like one of us. <laughs> and he spent all. That sounds like one of us. And he ended up in the pig pen. Golly. That's, that's where I ended up in the pig pen. All of us got our own pig pens. And he was in the pig pen. He hadn't took the first step. He was going around probably working that day, slopping them hogs, talking about, boy, I'm not ship coming. Everything's going to be all right. Shucking and jiving, jiving himself. You know what I mean? It ain't really that bad. You know. <laughs> I'm just going to drink a little beer, you know. <laughs> And one day he was able to take the first step. Thank God. See, the woman found the coin and the shepherd found the sheep. And the prodigal son found, he said, found himself. He found himself. You know, he got some reality. He said, look, I'm in the damn pig pen. Come on. Other guy with him probably say, hey, man, you've been here. <laughs> he saw himself in the pig pen of his life. And, and then after he saw himself in the pig pen, he said, you know, I believe, I came to believe that they're eating better. The servants is eating better at my father's house. He saw an alternative after he saw where he was. Then he, once he saw these two things, then he made a decision, he took some action, and he got back to his father's house. You know what I mean? Things got good for him. I get in trouble with this story all the time. I'm going to tell the last of the night. I usually don't, don't. They ain't around the night too much. But they said when he got back to his father's house, so they, they had a big party for him. God, they, uh, they killed a fatty calf, and everybody was, they was partying back, you know. Music was playing, and... They was having a good time. One old servant started up in the field. You know, he was, and his brother was up there. His old brother was up there in the field. And his old brother said, what's going on down there, man? He said, they're having a party. A party? What kind of party? He said, for your brother. He said, which one? The one that was lost. He said, you mean that one that's been out raising hell, drinking whiskey, chasing women and doing all that? Why, well, I've been here all these years working. And they're giving him a party. And I've been here working all these years. And they never had a party. He was mad. They say that was the guy that went out and started al and <laughs> These steps are old. It's simple procedure. Come in. Once we see where we are. And then we set an alternative. We are powerless and we believe. It didn't say we know. We believe that this power, and it says we cross over the bridge of reason to the shores of faith. We reason. If it works for him, I believe it'll work for me. Then if we have these two things, then we can proceed into step three. And step three carries us into the, how do we get from here to here? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. These are the steps which we take. This journey from step one to step two. And if we see that where we are, and we believe that this power, we have but two alternatives. Life, was, we've been living it. A life on a spiritual basis. Then it brings us to step three next week, which is 
we ought to make a decision. Or to choose between, choose which course of action we want. This is a, our individual decision. But do these first two steps put us for the first time in a position of some decision for the first time in our life? We really can, these steps give us an opportunity for something better. So next week we'll be begin, we'll be at the turning point, and we'll begin with step three. Mm -hmm.